This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Have you tried the Name Your Price tool yet? It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to find a rate that works for you. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive. Get your quote today at Progressive.com and see why four out of five new auto customers recommend Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Yeah, I guess it was like 30 something thousand dollars extra coming in per year. So I can like, I don't know, go out to dinner more or like buy a UTV or something. Or I could build a freaking bike park. It's a no brainer. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason Gravely. This episode actually comes from Without Compromise. This That's the show that I host through Athletic Brewing Company. That's the uh, that's the company I work for. We make non-alcoholic craft beer, uh, which you know might sound crazy to you, but you you definitely need to try it first. Uh, it's incredible. And also, you know, I, I, I love a crazy idea or two every once in a while. So uh, it, it's a great fit. But anyway, uh, this episode is, is is awesome for our show because Seth is really changing the world, really changing his community through mountain biking. Uh, when he started his YouTube channel, which is what he's known for, by the way, it's called it was called Seth's Bike Hacks. And now it's called Berm Peak. But when he started the channel, he was living in Miami in a condo, riding BMX bikes. Uh, and decided to start filming, just just filming what Trixie's done, you know, how-to videos, ramps he's building, and his show, through very hard work and a lot of dedication, has ballooned to over two million subscribers to be to, to make it where Seth is probably the most prominent mountain biking voice on YouTube, which is a big deal. It's 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 allowed him to travel all over the world mountain biking, and now it's actually allowed him to utilize the community's uh, impact and excitement to physically build a brand new bike park in the mountains of North Carolina. And we're going to hear about how he's doing that right now. So uh, whether you like mountain biking or not, it's a very applicable episode, very applicable principles to, to anything in life, pursuing something very outside of the box, very much a against the grain mentality. It, it's been really cool. And just so you know, I, I wanted to share one thing. Seth shared some advice that was off the record that I... um. He didn't ask for it to be off the record. I just didn't press record in, in, in enough time. But he said, uh, you know, I've never chased my dream. Like, I never had a rigid dream that I was sticking to. I've only chased the opportunities as they present themselves. Uh, themselves. And I, I've been thinking about that the last week or so. Like, wow, what a, what a great principle that is. Because it's like we can have such a hard dream, a hard facet. You know, it's set in stone. But we don't see the obvious opportunities that come our way or the obvious obstacles in the way of that dream you know if his example was you know if I wanted to be an NBA player uh, that just wasn't going to happen and Seth if you don't know is is pretty short uh, which isn't impossible but he he didn't have the basketball skills that's for sure but anyway I just wanted to share that I I kick myself for not recording that part but that happens every once in a while Uh, This episode is brought to us by The Restoration Depot, and they are online classes, a fun community, an engaging community uh, to do live classes with things like yoga, tai chi, mindfulness, meditation. For any of us that are pursuing, you know, really hard goals, very busy lives, you need to have that time to just relax, to, to center yourself, to just take a deep breath. And sometimes, you know, going to a class to help you do that is is really the best way to make yourself come to, come to that level of peace and come to that level of just relaxation before getting back into something busy. So I definitely recommend going to therestorationdepot.com, attending one of their live classes. You can talk to the instructor, you can interact with the instructor, and there's a lot of different classes they offer. And you can get your first class for only $5. You go on their website, the restorationdepot.com there's a link to the to your very first class uh and so i've been i've really been enjoying him and i think you will too but all right let's get into today's episode seth welcome to the show 
Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I always ask this first, and I, and I know the answer this time. I don't always know the answer, but where are you coming from today? Uh, out of Asheville, North Carolina. It's not exactly Asheville. I'm, I'm closer to Brevard, but it's easier to, easier to say Asheville. I, you know, I know you didn't grow up there. Can you tell us a little bit about about where you grew up? What what you kind of grew up doing? What were you into? What was your family like? Um, what were you encouraged to do even? And, and then we're going to kind of tie it all into what you're doing now. So I grew up in New York. That's where I spent most of my life till I was in my mid-20s. And I grew up riding bikes. I started riding a two-wheeler when I was some ridiculously low age, like, uh, three something. My dad just kept lifting up my training wheels more and more. There's a little oval circle in it, so you can adjust that upwards. And eventually, I'm on, you know, one of those ridiculous bikes with like the 12 inch wheels. At the time, there were no balance bikes or push bikes. And I'm riding this little tiny bike around, and the training wheels are off the ground. He took the training wheels off. I fell a few times that day, scraped myself up, and it was just love from that moment on. I just kept riding bikes. From there, I kind of took BMX a little more seriously when I got a little older. And that was the first type of biking that I would say I did seriously. When I say BMX, anytime you hear about BMX, you think of BMX racing or maybe skate parks. I was more of a street rider, like much like you would see a skateboarder just out on the street finding stuff to ride on. I had a lot of friends who did it. There was a pretty good scene where I lived. And... I spent unbelievable amount of time doing that. I learned how to do my 180s, my 360s, big bunny hops, hitting handrails, jumping gaps. It's where I learned all the things that have now become, you know, normal mountain bike skills. <laughs> they, they really translated over. Now, I, I always mountain biked a little bit. I had a mountain bike. There were some mountain bike trails by my house. Not a huge elevation change on Long Island, so... It was just, you know, pedaling around with some friends or my dad every, every now and then. But as I got older, I started taking mountain biking a little more seriously. As you do, you, you less of your friends are riding street. You get, uh, you're less likely to get away with trespassing or, or jumping off of somebody's staircase as you, uh, as you get some gray hairs. Right, and so right. <laughs> the, uh, the mountain bike comes out. And, and honestly, if you have the resources... I think mountain bikes a lot more fun. Um, BMX is cheaper. It's cheaper to find stuff to ride on. It's easier to get around. But on a mountain bike, you know, you, you need some transportation to get to and from. The parts are more expensive. But as an adult, it's just, it's so good. And it spans genders and age groups and demographics. It's just like, it's, it's, the perf it's one of the most perfect sports there is. The most perfect activity there is. Yeah, that's that's a great that's a great statement. That's a heck of a statement too. It, it's amazing. It's amazing. If you've been there to kind of not only watch it grow, to, but to help it grow. And I, I know I want to kind of get into that how you're doing that. But w when did it start to become more of what you did? You know what I mean? Like BMX, you say you got older, and you know the li you know, options were a little limited. How how did you find kind of that next? level for yourself would you just have to go out farther or try new things or build things yourself um, where you were in, in Long Island well uh when I was in my late 20s I moved to Florida and the reason I moved is I was I was working from home as a web developer and I was just sick of the New York winters and I wanted to be able to ride a bike around all the time and at that time I thought oh I'll probably get back into BMX and so I moved down to Florida where a bunch of my relatives were in South Florida. Florida is the butt of every joke. It gets a, a bad reputation. But the, the truth is that most people from Florida are super cool and there's lots of stuff to do there. It's good food. There's, there's parks. There's, uh, there's bike lanes. There's all sorts of stuff we do not have in Long Island uh, except for the good food. Um, but anyway, I moved down there and started working from home where the weather was a little warmer and I started to make friends and a lot of them rode bikes and I was just riding road bikes around, whatever I could get my hands on. And of course, um, jumping up and down curbs, jumping off of staircases, uh, breaking bikes that I probably shouldn't have been a doing that with. And then somebody said, Hey, you want to come mountain biking with us? And I was like, 
well, yeah, but where <laughs> do you mount? Like <laughs> where? Florida, Florida, you know? Yeah. And he's like, we got Olita, we have Amelia Earhart Park, we have Jonathan Dickinson. I'm like, wait, what? You guys have mountain? Like, what do you mean? Like, what kind of mountain biking is it? And it turns out that Florida has one of the most impressive volunteer uh, cultures that there is in mountain biking. I've never been anywhere in the country where more volunteers come out to work on the trails. And so flat or not, they build something fun to ride on. And so I fell back in love with mountain biking and I was going off of jumps. I was taken out on the street and, you know, I finally got my mountain bike all the way around into a 360 and I was just diving back in and kind of using all the things I learned in BMX to make mountain biking more interesting because in Florida, yeah, they build really cool stuff to ride on, but there are no sustained downhills. And so you have to find ways to spice it up. And I was doing that. And that's really when I started the channel. It was, I didn't start the YouTube channel with the intention of it growing big. I didn't think it was possible to grow a YouTube channel big. Like, you know, it, that's the same probability as, you know, becoming a famous person. You know, it's, it's the probability is very low. If you go into it thinking you're going to succeed at it, to some extent, you're either narcissistic or insane. And so I went into it thinking I was just going to have a little outlet for videos I wanted to make. And at the time in Florida where I was in the city, there, there would be group bike rides with literally hundreds of people. Like the whole streets would get shut down. And I'm not even talking about critical mass. I'm talking about just every Wednesday night. And I had local no notoriety. You know, everybody on a bike locally knew me because I was the guy that would get on a road bike and hop on the back wheel over and over again or, or uh, jump off a staircase or ride on the narrow, like, four-inch median on the bridge all the way across. And so it was sort of my outlet to those people. I was going to create content for them, and I figured that locally it could be something. And I was really surprised to find that people from all over were watching it. I knew in my mind with 100% certainty that nobody was going to watch it because if you go on YouTube, you can watch Danny McCaskill. You know, you could watch all the – one of – many Red Bull videos, you could watch professional riders, you could watch Global Mountain Bike Network, you could watch all these really serious mountain bikers and mountain bike channels. Why would you want to watch me? I'm doing little hacks in my backyard and riding around the street. And as it turns out, people can relate to that and relate to me a lot more than that superhero stuff. I was surprised, really surprised that people were watching. I was surprised the places they were coming from the fact that I didn't know any of them, they're just like, hey, dude, great videos. When are you going to post again? Or, or I subscribed, and I'm like, what is subscribing? And I kind of looked into it and uh, learned how to use YouTube as I learned how to make YouTube videos and become a YouTuber. Once I knew that I could make videos that could reach a lot of people, I knew with 100% certainty that there was no way to make money at it. I mean, that would be impossible. And that changed. The YouTube monetization program, which was relatively new to the mainstream at that point, I figured you get like 25 million views and you get like $4, but it turns out that YouTube is, you know, it, you can make a living. Um, and at the time, with the views I was getting, I was just extrapolating, looking at my growth, looking at like, okay, if I grow even at half the rate I am now, in a year, I'll be able to support myself. And I started thinking, do I want to, you know, stare into code and be on the phone all day doing website stuff? Or do I want to try and grow this into an actual career? And I was crazy enough to do that. I mean, the web thing was going great. I owned a home. I was doing fine. Uh, I had just gotten married. And uh, I decided to take the plunge into YouTube full time. And you, the people around me were, you know, kind of scared. Like, you sure you know what you're doing? And I'm like, uh, no, but I'm, but the numbers look good, and I'm gonna make it work. You've got to listen to the founder story at Athletic Brewing. Same thing. Great career. I would love to hear that. Story. Great career in finance. It's the first episode of this podcast. Great career, and decided, you know, this non-alcoholic beer is what I'm gonna go after. You talk about people thinking you're crazy. 
It was, you know, it was that. Oh, yeah. But you, you, man, you, you're, I mean, th- th- you couldn't write the script better. You're a BMXer by trade in South Florida, and you're going to be the premier voice for the mountain bike community. Who do you think you are is what I would have said. <laughs> so what, what, to me, what gave you the, because for a lot of creators, a lot of people don't think they can start giving advice until they're absolutely experts um, what, what, what gave you that kind of confidence or, or did at that point, did you have enough knowledge, have enough of a base to start being able to share really valuable content right away? Well, uh, first of all, I probably underplayed how much experience I had mountain biking before then. Okay. You know, it, it was a big part of my life and I had also worked at bike shops. And so I had broken bikes down to the, you know, down to the frame. I had done every repair imaginable And so from a technical standpoint, I really knew a lot. One area where I was lacking is I was not well-traveled. I hadn't traveled the country mountain biking until my YouTube channel. And that's what really allowed me to do it. So now I can speak on locations and traveling and culture and all that. But when I started the YouTube channel, I didn't talk about any of that stuff. In fact, a lot of my content wasn't even about mountain biking. There were road bikes, tall bikes, unicycles, it was just Seth's bike hacks. Every type of bike uh, was part of it. And as a whole, as a well-rounded cyclist who knew about every type, I actually, I actually was well-rounded and knew my stuff. Uh, mountain biking specifically, I definitely had a little ways to go before I could be an authority on it. So, so it sounded like you were transferring a lot of that knowledge. And, and, and yeah, you can build up a, a, a huge amount of knowledge and skills working a relatively short amount of time in a bike shop. So you were transferring that almost to this not new medium of YouTube, but just, you know, putting it out there for people to 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 utilize and to to be more, you know, more exposure for the sport, more knowledge all around, just helping people, sharing some of your knowledge, sharing some of that experience. W- when for you did you start seeing success in that? Probably about a month in. I kind of <laughs> had a pop in I guess one of my videos kind of caught on. I got a pop in traffic and I started looking at the traffic and it was like pretty much doubling every two weeks. And I think in the first year I ended up being past 10,000 subscribers at some point, which was just an unfathomable number to me at at that point. And I, you know, that's when I started, you know, being a business owner before that, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm extrapolating and I'm like, well, if this keeps growing even close to this rate, it looks way better, way better than what I'm doing right now. And uh, so I did both concurrently for a while. And during that time, I was seeing more and more success on YouTube. I was seeing, you know, numbers that I thought were big a month ago. Now they've just been crushed. And then that would happen another month later. I started to refine my style of videos, refine my editing invest in additional video equipment. I mean, I was, and very early on, within the first year, I started an LLC and started running it like a business so that I could write, you know, make write-offs and, you know, be serious about it. I just, I took it seriously from very early on because there were so many people watching and I felt like I was letting them down. It wasn't for a while that I even turned on the monetization. I was just doing it because I was just doing it because people, uh, I felt like I had a responsibility to. I was a part of people's weeks. When did you decide to jump all in? And, and what did that feel like? When I decided to go all in, like 100% full-time YouTuber and not do anything else, that was in 2017. So that was about two years after I started the channel. And... I started telling each of my clients like, hey, two months from now, you got to have somebody else to kind of help you. I can give you some recommendations, but like, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. And at the time, that was very scary. I had just bought a new house. We had just moved to Asheville. My wife had just quit her job as an office manager at a doctor's office because, you know, we were moving. And, And by the way, we moved for the hell of it. It wasn't for work or something. We just moved because we wanted to move and because we loved Asheville. Um, And I thought it would be good for the channel. And and my wife just loved the mountains and the scenery. So in the midst of all this, I decided 
yeah, I'm just going to put 100% of my time into YouTube. And through the extrapolations that I had made, through the numbers, and through just being kind of a little crazy, I decided that if I could put my full time into it, it would actually be very strange if it failed. You, you were betting on yourself. Yeah. I mean, I was going to have to make it work. That was my only option. So I started getting rid of clients that like, and, and by the way, it wasn't like I have to build a website for them to make money. It was like I had monthly contracts with people. I had a steady revenue stream coming in every month with my business. And I was shutting those revenue streams down with the hopes that I could free up the time and make my YouTube channel work. And, um, and my advice to anyone else who's thinking to do this is there's no quicker way to run yourself into bankruptcy than to start a YouTube channel and, and bank on it succeeding. You know, uh, me, you know, the only thing I could, th the only quicker way that I could think to fail would be to start a non-alcoholic brewery. <laughs> Come on, man. No, I'm just playing. But you're, I'm, I'm telling you, your story is so similar. It's like, it's to the outside, it's like, why would you do this? You have something that's in demand. You have a business that's built. Why disrupt a good thing when that that in itself is so hard to build for so many people or so hard to find in a lot of ways? W w what was that conversation you had with yourself saying, this is this is something that 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 is definitely out of the box, but I want to go for versus, I, I guess the more secure. I don't know how you were viewing it, but what what ultimately gave you the confidence? I mean, I know the growth is there, and I know that you were kind of beating the odds in that way, but it's still scary. It's got to be still scary. Um, I I take facts and evidence pretty seriously. That's everything, and the facts and evidence said that continuing along the route of YouTube would be more fruitful than continuing my path as a web developer. Every single number and every single piece of data that I could point to showed me that that was the better decision. And so like any other business decision, I took the one that was better, that was going to yield more success. And in this case, a lot more happiness. So far... I'd say, you know, four years in from that, that jump, would you say that's true? <laughs> to some extent. I mean, it's been very exciting and I'm very passionate about what I do, but definitely, especially over the last few years, building it to where it's been and taking it really seriously, I have foregone personal relationships, family relationships, definitely got so lost in work at some points where I didn't even have any outside inspiration to draw from and I had writer's block. And now I'm starting to find a better work-life balance. And by the way, you look at what I do and you say, well, what do you mean work-life balance? Like that is life. Why wouldn't you want to be doing what you're doing? And it's true. I, I love what I'm doing. It's extremely exciting. I'm in, I'm, I wake up every morning super motivated. Like I don't have to drag myself out of bed and commute. I just pop out of bed and want to get back to what I was doing. Like, I love it. I can't stress that enough. But at the same time, you, you have to turn it off sometimes. I have a daughter. I have a wife. Um, I have friends. I have family that I have to visit. And that part of my life is important, too. And my other hobbies are important, too. And so it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to believe that somebody who does what I do would need a break, but it, it gets tiring. There's also editing, strategizing, running around for supplies. The way we edit the videos, it makes it look like everything was easy and everything went smoothly. But some of these projects are are heinous, um, especially the editing part. And sometimes it rains and then we have to go twice as hard the next day. It's hard. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. But no, I don't look back with any regret. I am happier. Um, Every day I learn to balance work and life better and make this a uh, more sustainable career. What I was doing before was not sustainable. Like for the last, like, let's say six months ago to like maybe a year and a half before that was, was completely unsustainable what I was doing. And I, I've dialed it back a little bit. Absolutely. No, I, I can totally get that. You know, hosting a podcast, people think, oh, you get to talk to all these cool people. And 
Yes, you do. <laughs> but that it, it's lit, it's like growing a flower, as I've told someone before. It's like the fl- you see the flower. Everyone sees the flower, and it's beautiful, and it's awesome. But the, you're like, well, I planted that six months ago, and I've had to till it. And, you know, I've, yeah. I've had to pull the weeds. I've had to water it. I've had to fertilize it, it every day. And you get to see that flower and get, you know, get to take a right. picture. But it's it's there's so much behind it. it, so much behind it. And people are imagining you. People are imagining a slow motion shot of you with the sun in your hair with a watering can, and they think that's all you. <laughs> right. <laughs> that was all of it. Not you hauling the bag of fertilizer, and you know, you're right. It's it's like that. They see the end result and it looks fun, but it's just like anything else. And I think that's why so many YouTube channels fail is people way underestimate how much work it is and how seriously they have to take it. Like how many notes we take per day, how many lists, how much scheduling, how dotted my calendar is. Um, I do all the things that one would do at a normal office job or running a normal business. Uh, Probably even more so. I have a lot of friends with businesses and they're not that organized. (laughs) They just, they figure it out as they go along. I'm like militant. So it's, it's a lot. And if you're going to start a YouTube channel, you have to understand that the competition you're up against is, is absolutely insane. So just think what's the highest level you could do it at. That's where you have to be if you want to make it work. And for you, it, it, it seems like you get to try all these new projects now that are maybe what you wouldn't have expected yeah. when you first started the channel. Can you tell us about some of the unique things you've been able to do? Well, you know, originally the YouTube channel was about bikes. And originally the YouTube channel was about hacks and you get bored doing the same thing. And you also run out of ideas. Like there are channels that pigeonhole themselves and they have to do one topic. And then they, the content starts to get repetitive and they start to, they start to just turn into a content farm where they have to churn something out every week. And I, I get bored of things really quick and I like to change things up. So I started doing things that I was interested in. And most of them were related to biking. And the, the really big thing that happened was building mountain bike features and trails. So when I moved to Asheville, I finally had a backyard. I wasn't living in a city anymore. I had a one-car garage, and I had a tiny backyard, like a third of an acre. That's tiny for the country. More, more so, the land was completely unusable. Like the whole yard was at a 45-degree angle. I think there's a shot of me on Instagram mowing my lawn, and I'm like, basically laying on the ground, like pushing the lawnmower up the hill. (laughs) Like in Asheville, you will see people mowing their entire lawns with weed whackers. But anyway, this whole unusable tiny yard, and I started digging trails in it. And the original trail was nothing. I just cut away the grass and did a little bit of benching. And I I named it though. I named it Berm Creek. And I made trail signs. I made a trailhead kiosk. Like I made all the, I went way over the top for what, for the little bits of grass that I scraped away, right? And people loved that. They loved that there were trail signs. They loved that there was a kiosk. They loved that the trail system had a name, that there was a map, that all the trails had names. They were like, you know, uh, 15, 20 feet long. And they were like more Berm Creek. When's the next Berm Creek video? So I just really dove head first into this trail building. And eventually I said, man, First of all, I don't have any privacy anymore. My house is right by the road. People are coming up to my door. People are taking selfies in front of the house. We got to get the hell out of here. But then also, uh, I need more space to build trails. So we moved to uh, further out into the country with more land and way f- we're really far from the road. We're like a quarter mile from the road. And even at the road, there's an electronic gate. And now I can just go to town. And that's sort of what the channel became at that point was building building trails and that came from doing normal bicycle stuff to doing mostly mountain bike stuff and now i've branched into i mean just anything that somebody who likes to be outside with like still with a focus on mountain biking but you know any any person who likes to be outside and do diy stuff and be out in the woods and use chainsaws and you know do country stuff that's that's sort of what we do here now that's awesome. So cool. C- can you tell us a little bit about one of your latest projects? One of your latest projects, which is Berm Park. T- 
taking kind of sure. is it is it just an extension of that idea of your backyard and just turning it into more and more and making it something even bigger, even better, and something more people can get involved in? Well, it's a lot of things. So first of all, I have traveled the country and I've seen other places that are further along than we are, right? So they've they have municipalities that are more forward thinking. They're investing in mountain biking and actually getting a return on it. And in terms of community health, in terms of fun, in terms of property values, in terms of everything. I mean, uh, one of the reasons that Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, invests so much in trails is that they have people coming to work for Walmart corporate, and they want it to be a cool place to live. And it works. You know, it's a place people want to live now. It's definitely a place that people want to visit. And so... I was preaching this. Everybody should be building bike parks. Why doesn't everybody do what these kind of cities are doing? And so when I realized I had an opportunity to try and spearhead a project, I thought, well, I would be a hypocrite if I didn't do that. How can I tell everybody else to do it if I don't go through it and see what the pitfalls are and the, and the challenges and, and learn how to do it? And the way that opportunity arose was through Patreon. A lot of people know what Patreon is. If you are a creator uh, on YouTube or TikTok or whatever, it's a way that you can get revenue and you can do it by offering additional content or just by having people support you for, for doing you. There's a guy on YouTube, Ave. He doesn't get any sponsors. He doesn't take any money for anything, nothing free from companies. And he reviews tools and he buys these tools with his own money and he takes them apart. And so I support him on Patreon. I give him a few bucks every month along with thousands of other people so that we can keep seeing these videos. And if I didn't give him that money, he would still do it because there's other people doing it. But that's not, how, that's not how supporting people should work. You know, everybody should pitch in. If you can, if you can afford a few bucks, you should pitch in if it's something that you like and you believe in. And that's what Patreon is. And that's what I was using it for. People were giving me a few bucks every month. And I was giving them some extra content, some behind the scenes stuff, some podcasts. And it got to the point where, first of all, it wasn't something I wanted to spend that much time on. And second of all, I didn't really need the charity dollars. And first of all, I wasn't, I wasn't taking money for nothing. I was giving them podcasts and some extra content, but it was still Patreon. And I still felt like, these were people who wanted to support me and I wanted to give them more. And so one day I said, Hey, starting next month, uh, none of this money is going to go to me. I'm going to put it all away in an account and we are going to save up for a bike park. And everybody was like, yep, that sounds good. Let's do this. This is awesome. Uh, a few people were like, Seth, you know how much a bike park costs? Like, this is crazy. Like, you know, you're going to need more. Right. People giving you $3 a month. Isn't going to pay for that. Yes. So uh, they were like, we're still going to support you. We still think you're going to figure it out, but you can't do this. And they were right. They were, they were totally right. But it's been over two years since then, and we've come a long way. Now we have outside sponsors like Athletic Brewing. We have a town who's cooperating with us and giving us land to do it on. We have, uh, we have so many different angles that are going to make this work. But nobody would have taken me seriously if I didn't have those original people that were going to plunk down money and make it happen. Because by the time I started talking to you know, municipalities and talking to trail builders and stuff, we had a significant amount of money. And we were kind of like, hey, we're going to build this with or without anybody's help. So if you want to jump on board to a succeeding project, let's go. That was sort of the... That was sort of the angle that we took because we were going to make it work no matter what. It just might have taken longer for us to save up the cash. It would have taken us longer to get en enough patrons. But we had the attitude of this is happening with or without anybody's help. If we have to buy land, no matter what, this is happening. And when you go into a project with that attitude, everybody wants in because now they know that you have skin in the game. You know, if you don't want to invest money into a project that might not succeed. It makes you look like a bad investor and it's a waste of money. And so 
the fact that we were kind of just going head first, like this is when it's happening, we're doing it. We, everybody jumped on board. We had so much support behind the project. And since then it's been kind of all green lights. I'm not going to say there weren't challenges or there weren't some roadblocks, but I mean, we've raised more than we originally wanted. We got more support than we originally thought we would. And we're building a bigger, better park than we thought we were going to. Psst, want to hear something amazing? Oh, and feel free to tell your friends too. So Kohl's, they're having a huge sale on summer stuff. And if you live for sunny days like I do, you need to check it out. I got 40% off a new patio set, Food Network grilling essentials for 20% off, and 50% off those yard games my kids won't stop talking about. Best part? I got an extra 15% off and some Kohl's cash. It almost makes being cooped up all winter worth it. Almost. Select styles 15% offer ends May 16th. Some exclusions apply. See store or calls.com for details. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Are you thinking more about how to tighten up your budget these days? Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save over $700 on average, and customers can qualify for an average of six discounts when they sign up. A little off your rate each month goes a long way. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National annual average insurance savings by new customers surveyed in 2020. Potential savings will vary. Discounts vary and are not available in all states and situations. Unreal. I absolutely love it. Activating the community, being selfless, you know, and just, it just, can, can you imagine when you started filming those videos that you'd be building a bike park? Not that long later. Uh, no, <laughs> no, I, I really didn't. And it's not selfless. A part of it's totally selfish because I want a bunch of jumps to ride near me. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But I, I guess just, just setting it, you know, that your Patreon's doing really well. From what I, you know, from what from what it looks oh, like, yeah. I don't know how it is compared to what you were hoping for, but it's like making it about the community, making it about something bigger than just you know Seth's pocket. You know, it, it's inspiring, it's yeah. exciting, and it's and it shows folks what is capable with a, a, a concentrated community, what they can do. It's pretty awesome. Well, it's also maybe not everybody thinks like this, but like from my perspective, it was also way better thing to do for my own life. Like if I was being completely selfish, it it was a better thing to do because like, okay, so yeah, I guess it was like 30 something thousand dollars extra coming in per year. So I can like, I don't know, go out to dinner more or like buy a UTV or something or I could build a freaking bike park. Like what, like it's a no brainer. Like, of course, build the bike park is the better decision that's way more fun. And to that end, every day I see bike parks driving down the highway. I'll see like a, a loaded Tesla or like a, a Lamborghini or something. And I'm like, bike park, like that person could have built a bike park. Cause it's literally, they cost more than a bike park. And I, I get it. You know, you work hard and you want to get something for yourself. And I guess an exotic car, like a Lamborghini, it goes fast and it impresses people, but you can go fast at a bike park. And if you really want to impress somebody, you'd be like, hey, that park's named after me. Like, that's pretty impressive. So I would like people to see when this is all said and done that if they are a person of means that can put into the community, I want to show how rewarding it can be to them. That it's, it's a better decision than buying a yacht or a, or a car. Great way to put it. Leave a legacy, a lasting legacy. You know, I mean, if there's one car I have ever, ever wanted, it's a Tesla, but it is hard when you could sure. do so many more things with, with the 50 grand that you would have spent minimum. Sure. Um, I, I'm excited to get into this cause it, it, it's talking a little bit more about, you know, your just, just kind of some of the things outside of what you do, but really rapid fire. Number one, what I like to always ask is what are you most curious about right now outside of what you do with YouTube and mountain biking in general? I want to learn to do more things, uh, specifically with trail building. I want to learn to use machines. I want to own a machine. I want to learn more about grading. I want to, it's like a new thing that I want to get really good at. I'd say that probably interests me most. Couldn't pry you completely away from the world, but that's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say your proudest achievement is outside of outside of what you've done with, uh, with, with Berm Peak and uh, Seth's Bike Hacks, formerly known as Seth's Bike Hacks? Uh, um, 
doing it twice. I, I, I started a business on my own when I was in my 20s and brought it up to success. I squashed it and started a new thing. And a lot of people would be happy to do it once. I'm really proud of myself that um, I was able to do it twice. I had normal jobs and bosses and stuff before that, and that wasn't, that wasn't what, how I wanted to live my life. Well, how about this then? This will be a good one. What is the biggest goal that you haven't yet achieved? Mm, I, I honestly, I don't even have an answer for that. The biggest goal that I haven't yet achieved, I would like to become a better organizational leader. I'm not really, like, I'll have people working for me, but I've never been able to build an organization that's like a fine, like a well-oiled machine. And I wonder if my future holds that, if I could become a good organizational leader. Because even when I was a web developer, I wasn't a very good organizational leader. The business is really dependent on me. Even my business right now, you know, Burn Peak, is really dependent on me. If I disappear, it disappears. And good organizational leaders can make organizations that outlast them. And I haven't been able to do that. Is there a hobby that you have that folks don't know about or you uh, you kind of wish you had more time to try out? I know grading and, and, and trail building, but anything else? I'll give you as quick of an answer as I can. Uh, over the past five years, five and a half years running this channel, I've lost all my hobbies because I haven't had time for them. And only recently, I've taken up RC cars. And I love it because it has all the same things as mountain biking. You get to go outside. You get to get better at it. You get to make changes to it and then go out and try it out and see how those changes made. You get to break things and fix them. It's just endless. And it, it, has, it has so many similarities to mountain biking. And a big company did a study, and they saw that – I don't know if it works the other way around, but people who drive RC cars – their biggest hobby that they all shared was mountain biking. So there's a huge crossover. I don't know if it's the same if you go with mountain bikers. They, they probably all share hobbies like hiking or, or rock climbing or something or kayaking. But if you go reverse from RC cars, so many of them mountain bike. And continually when I see the content on YouTube, I see like bikes in the background or they're wearing a bike shirt. And so it happened all accidentally with me, but... Now I know why. Now I know why I've taken such a liking to it. Is it's really has everything. It's it's a near perfect activity as well. Uh, trails, you can kind of take them on the same trails, maybe. Oh, I can take them on the same trails. A absolutely. Oh, okay, that makes more sense now. Interesting. Um, sweet. Uh, well, well, let me ask you this. At, here at Athletic Brewing. Our slogan is brew without compromise. And, and, and in order to do that, we've decided and we kind of realize that we have to live without compromise, too. You can't really just do one thing really, really, really well without kind of striving for that as a lifestyle in general. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Like totally. you have to kind of live that way. And so what, what does it mean to you to live without compromise? Wake up early, do something meaningful every single day. Wish I had more time to prepare and word for it, but but um, always improve. You can always do better than you did. You can always improve against yourself, right? You don't have to be better than everyone else. You just have to be better than yourself. And it's confusing when, when people don't try to be better than they were the day before. It's it's free, usually. <laughs> it's free. You can always, you can always try it. It's free usually, like you like try it. It's it's awesome. I think that to live without compromise, you always have to do better than the day before. And if you and if you don't, then try again the next day. It, it's not only free; it almost it almost pays, you know, over time. It's totally you can't <laughs> afford to not do that, right? <laughs> First of all. Thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to this show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. Psst. 
Want to hear something amazing? Oh, and feel free to tell your friends too. So, Kohl's, they're having a huge sale on summer stuff. And if you live for sunny days like I do, you need to check it out. I got 40% off a new patio set, Food Network grilling essentials for 20% off, and 50% off those yard games my kids won't stop talking about. Best part? I got an extra 15% off and some Kohl's cash. It almost makes being cooped up all winter worth it. Almost. Select styles 15% off for ends May 16th. Some exclusions apply. See store or Kohl's.com for details. Nobody builds 5G like Verizon builds 5G. Because we're the engineers who built the most reliable network in America. And the more you do with 5G, the more building it right matters. The more your network matters. The more Verizon engineers going the extra mile matters. It's us pushing us. It's Verizon versus Verizon. 5G built right from America's most reliable network. Most reliable based on rankings from Metrics second half 2020 U.S. report of three mobile networks. Results may vary. Award is not an endorsement.